so often when we think about relationships with narcissists, um, intimate relationships, we don't really think about the other side of same sex couples being involved with a narcissist and the challenges, the unique challenges that they face. There's so much stigma that can go on if there's two men together and the police are called. Uh, you're both big men, like, get over it. Look what happened. We, we told you so. Look what happens. See, you wanted this. Look what happened. A lot of victim blaming in excess of what normal um, relationship heterosexual people deal with. And um, I want you to understand that this is a completely different rule book. And my guest today is Amber Alt. She's an author, a therapist, and an expert on this topic. Today we're going to discuss the challenges and the hurdles that a person in a same-sex relationship might have to deal with. This is Tracy, and welcome to my channel. My channel is dedicated to helping victims of narcissist abuse, and right now um, we're doing this special series on bringing you the experts, bringing you people that write the books, that talk the talk, walk the walk, and they're here to help us. So let's welcome Amber. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited about the work that you're doing and the chance to talk to the people who are following you. Thank you. And, and the work that you're doing is um, so important. And I, I can't wait to share this with everybody. Um, today, we're going to talk about same sex couples and the challenges that they face. But it would be helpful for my audience if we just heard a little bit about you. Sure. Yeah. So I am both a sociologist and a uh, clinical social worker. I have um, a coaching practice that's based out of my online presence at www.amberaultault.com um, and then a bricks and mortar practice here in Madison, Wisconsin, which is where I live. Um, so I'm trained in couples therapy and also have a long focus in my practice of working with people who are family members, partners, uh, and some other, sometimes affiliates, you know, people who are um, uh, in a workplace with somebody who has a cluster B personality disorder. So those are the borderline narcissistic, antisocial, and histrionic folks. So often I work with somebody who's directly involved with these folks. Sometimes um, families come to me and say, we're worried about our family member who seems to have gotten it really entangled with somebody who's who who is scary to us so i do direct coaching with folks i offer some courses um through my website and um, i have a couple of books that are related to this topic of exiting and understanding the dynamics in in toxic relationships so um, i'm pretty passionate about this um my feeling is life is short and our world is in trouble and the more we have happy healthy supportive relationships the more we can really both enjoy our lives and also be present to make the world a better place so i love your passion i i think that anybody that um comes into a niche to help victims turn into survivors they do it out of love. They do it out of passion. There's generally a um, motivating factor in their lives that have made them choose this particular niche. Um, but I'm, I'm very excited to hear about what we're going to talk about today. So let's dive into um, the challenges of same sex couples when they're with one of these cluster B personalities. Yeah. So I work with both folks in opposite sex dynamics and same-sex dynamics. And, and one of the things that's been really apparent to me is while there are these variations, um, the similarities uh, in toxic dynamics are uh, across those kinds of relationship forms are very, very similar. So um, I want to talk today about some of the, the nuances of difference in experience with folks who are involved with the same sex partner, but mostly those experiences relate to 
comfort and help seeking, um, comfort in kind of coming out a second time as somebody in a toxic relationship. But the dynamics themselves are often really similar. And as you know, many people who find themselves in an adult relationship that is a toxic relationship will have grown up in a household where they saw something similar or where they didn't see the kinds of things we want. And so um, gay people often grow up in straight households and they see those toxic dynamics between their parents. And as much as they swear off and say, I'll never do this, um, they still might find themselves in a same sex relationship that has the same very similar dynamic. So one of the challenges that people in same sex relationships who, who discover themselves in a toxic dynamic face is an additional layer of shame. So we still live in a world that's heterosexist and homophobic. And so to come out to one's family, to come out to one's parents, to come out to one's community, one's faith group can be, you know, a, 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 is an act of courage. Um, it can mean losing some relationships. It can mean really kind of carrying the rainbow flag and saying, look, our relationships are just as good as anybody else's relationships. But then there's some additional pressure to make our relationships be better. And so when we discover that our relationship is wobbly or worse, it can be really hard then to go back to the people who are closest to us that we've kind of brought with us on this journey of, hey, I'm gonna date somebody and get involved with somebody and maybe marry somebody of the same sex and say to them, my partner is doing these things and I'm really uncomfortable with it or um, we're having these horrible fights or, I'm paying all the bills and they're not contributing because of that fear that the family or the community or the, the you know, faith-based organization is gonna see, see, this is the problem. We told you not to get involved with somebody of the same sex. So there's this additional layer of fear and shame and work. I think there's always that in toxic relationships. Lots of women involved with, with narcissistic men don't, want to talk about what's happening because they have some shame around it and but i think that women involved with women or uh, men involved with men have this additional burden and challenge of dealing with um kind of the the stereotypes that our culture might put on those relationships to begin with we fought so hard for this is june when we're having this conversation this is gay pride month right and so we have this idea of oh coming out and now i will find my one and it turns out my one will be of the same sex and getting involved with somebody and having all of those feelings of romance and excitement and then discovering uh oh i might have been conned here is it's really it, quite devastating yeah so, so that's one layer of difference, I would say. And that's a really important one because all on the heterosexual line, the shame is like, if there was a shameometer, it would be up here <laughs> because everybody just, it's, it's like, it, you take on the burden of failing, not making the right choice, um, the pain and the torture that generally comes with this horrific discard is, is up there anyway. But add on to that, that the stereotypes of being in a same-sex relationship, um, even if you look at the way that police um, and react to these situations and how they will judge um, two men that are together and go, well, you know, first of all, go ahead, look what you did. But then there's also this factor of you're a big guy, like stop complaining. This isn't real. You're making this up. Nobody believes them. And it's really hard for someone in a same sex couple. Yeah, we have, we benefit in this country that now same sex marriage is legal. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, the laws that apply to seem to opposite sex relationships apply to uh, folks in same sex marriages, but they're continues to be these, these, there are these cultural issues mm -hmm. um, because folks have been, folks who are still enforcing those laws have still been raised, who are now enforcing those laws have still been raised in um, a society where there is this kind of bias and not a lot of education. So as you say, I mean, many states have mandatory arrests uh, for domestic violence calls mm -hmm. and in the majority of those cases, in the majority of those states, when a call comes in for domestic violence, the assumption is 
there's a heterosexual couple and that the male is a perpetrator. Hmm. It's not always the case that the male is a perpetrator, but it is the case the majority of times. And so the majority of times there's a mandatory arrest, it's of the man. Um, so what do you do when it's a same sex couple? Do you arrest the bigger person? Do you arrest the older person? Do you arrest the smaller person? Do you arrest the person who made the call? Mm -hmm. I've known of a number of instances between both men and women where the person who was the most psychologically abusive has uh, done their best to provoke their victim partner into some kind of a self-defense stance. And once the person moves into that place, um, the perpetrator says, see, you touched me, and now uh, I have every right mm -hmm. to defend myself against you defending yourself against me. And so then the victim can often uh, take responsibility that is not theirs. Mm -hmm. So if they've been physically intimidated, they're up against the wall, somebody's coming at them, you have every right to put your hands out and defend yourself. But if you're the first person to make contact and then the other person uh, beats you and says, look, I'm doing this because you touched me first, then it gets very confusing even for the, even for the victim who is more prone to blame themselves than to blame their partner. And it's complicated for police officers who show up. As you say, they may be dismissive. Hey, this is just guys fighting is one of the stereotypes of domestic violence in uh men's relationships with each other and in women's relationships with each other it's like you're women it's it's not a real fight this is not domestic violence so there's that when the police even are called but a lot of times people in same-sex relationships are reluctant to call the police because they know this might be how it goes they also are worried about as people in uh, and of course it's it, it it is the it's absolutely the case that gay and lesbian communities are multicultural so the gay and lesbian community is not just a white community. It's, you know, people of all ethnic groups um, are aligned with the gay and lesbian community. But like people in all kinds of minority groups in this country, we're reluctant to call law enforcement because uh, sometimes law enforcement turns against us. Um, so there's that. And there's also then reputation management. Like, oh, you know, we don't want to play into this stereotype of dysfunctional relationships. So somebody I interviewed for my book on um, uh, toxic lesbian relationships was um, living in a, a rural environment. Um, her ex-partner showed up. This person had been in jail more than once, had a history of domestic violence. I mean, there's real documented history of this person's aggression. Shows up in the middle of the night, uh, forces her way in, and um, proceeds to uh, violate the, the victim, the person that I had interviewed. But that person who had, was actually trained in self-defense and said, I know all this stuff. I know how this works. I can't believe I'm in this situation, um, did not call the police because her concern was if she called law enforcement, then it's gonna be, oh, there are those darn dykes. Uh, <laughs> you know, just causing trouble and making drama. And so she didn't call for help when she really most needed it because of her concern of how that would change her status in the community. So lots of times mm -hmm. the call doesn't happen. And if the call happens, it can be a mixed bag in terms of, in terms of what the outcome is. Um, but I do wanna say, so it's the case that violence happens in toxic same-sex relationships. It's also the case that if violence isn't happening, it doesn't mean the relationship isn't toxic because there are lots of emotional dynamics um as as you know you know verbal abuse financial exploitation uh taking advantage of people's time and energy deception manipulation um gaslighting all of these things happen without physical violence necessarily being in the mix and this is one of the other uh challenges i think that 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 people in same-sex relationships have they have this stereotype that oh yeah you know dad beat mom but that's not what's happening here um and so is this really a toxic relationship mm, you know that well there's no violence so we can really kind of dismiss or underestimate 
that long erosion that happens when you get worn down by somebody not treating you very nicely, not uh, taking good care of your relationship, not taking good care of you and, um, you know, taking advantage of you. So that's one of the other challenges I think is that the idea is, oh, this isn't an abusive relationship um, because women don't abuse each other, men don't abuse each other. This is something that straight people do. This is why I've been careful in my work to talk about toxic relationships as opposed to abusive relationships because toxic relationships are absolutely abusive, but it's hard for people to identify. Nobody wants to say, oh, I'm in an abusive relationship. I mean, yeah. it's really hard to do. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking as you were, were talking, um, I went to a domestic violence conference uh, a few weeks ago and I actually had lunch with a police officer who was on the board of a domestic violence shelter. So I was like, okay, talk to me. Like, what do police think and why, why this, you know, the mandatory arrest? How do they know which ones? Because um, I think I told you I was arrested by my narcissist and um, I just was sitting there like totally like what the hell just happened? I, I was brain fogged. I didn't understand it. And yet I was the one that was really confused. I was the one that just didn't understand it. And he was the one that could have his composure and just be there like, oh, you know, this is what she did. And I was afraid and all of these lies. And, and like he told his child, I tried to kill him which was the most ridiculous thing in the world, but that made it into the police report, which put me into jail and it was all a lie. And yet I asked the police officer, like, how do you, how does it, an officer decide? I'm sitting there crying and he's sitting there going, oh, I was abused. How does a police officer, and he said that 90% of the police officers don't even want to go on domestic violence calls. That's it, right. It's a headache for them. They don't really want to, they don't want to hear the real story. They don't want to. So what they, they do is they look for the one that is more composed. So me being hysterical crying, going, what's happening here? I looked more guilty. So that's why they, they have the, the right to judge and make their own choice, but they're going to go with the easier one if that makes sense because he was so calm and cool and charming and victimized <laughs> but I was the one like hysterical not like yelling at anyone just like shaking in fear and that was just an easy thing all right let's pop her in she 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 should go so to hear the police perspective of how they need to be educated to hear someone that he says he spends two or three hours at a DV call and analyzes because it usually is the one that's cowering in the corner that has been abused all along and might have taken that swing or something because they were defending themselves. Right. So it was interesting to hear a police officer's take on the whole thing and um, truly one that is there for the cause and trying to make a change within his world of police, within the um, police and legal system, you have to have somebody step up and say, we need to like, look at this. You need to analyze this in a different way because you're arresting the victims. So happy to hear that that's being done, but I know it's not being done in 95% of DV cases. So mm -hmm. I know it's challenging for same sex couples as well in that whole stigma going on. Yeah. I think one of the the, when I teach this, one of the things that we, we get to surmise from recognizing that um, rates of domestic violence and probably rates of emotional violence and emotional abuse are pretty similar in same-sex relationships as the rates in opposite-sex relationships. One of the things we come to realize is that this is about power. Mm -hmm. So it's not about, you know, men are bad and women are weak because it is happening in same sex relationships mm -hmm. between women and between men. Then we have to say, okay, let's, let's take this away apart from masculinity and femininity and look at how people 
work with and operate with and share power and how people abuse power and exploit, use their power to exploit other people in, in all kinds of relationships. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's not as simple as, um, you know, men abuse their power and they are always using it against women. It's, 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 mu it's way muddier. Yeah. Than yeah. So, so working backwards, it allow again, allows us to see that while same sex couples have some, some challenges in help seeking and in coming out about the toxic relationship and about getting, getting to like, if somebody, if a, if a, um, a, a person who's being victimized or who is concerned that they're being victimized or is concerned about the dynamic wants to seek coaching or therapy. Again, this can be really um, challenging because uh, nobody wants to really educate their therapist. Mm -hmm. so you want to go in and know that the person you're talking to has an understanding of, oh yeah, you're part of a minority community and the person you're involved with was involved with somebody who was involved with your ex-girlfriend three years ago, <laughs> like who, who like understands that in small communities, this is how things sometimes work and it adds to the difficulty of getting out. So, so people in same-sex relationships do have these additional challenges or these different challenges, I think, in some ways. But the dynamics of uh, lack of empathy, lack of compassion, um, lack of care, uh, power over, exploitation, all of the, and then the devalue and discard, uh, the, the on again, off again, the roller coaster stuff, all of that mm -hmm. shows up in these relationships, you know, across, across the board. Yeah. yeah. And as you know, I know from your work, it's not just about romantic relationships because this can be siblings, this can be parents, this can be adult children, um, this can be the boss, right? So it's, it's really starting to, I think people can really do for themselves, and I know that you're helping people do this, is, is kind of learn what that pattern looks like mm -hmm. so that they can name it when they see it. Right. And I think people have to, I told this to my meetup group last night, the labeling um, while my channel and, and my website is dedicated to the narcissist factor. So many people get obsessed with is he or she a narcissist? It doesn't matter. Like they could be any spectrum on the, the cluster B wheel there. They could be psychopaths. It doesn't matter what you call them. If the behavior is one that is not good and they're abusive, then it's time to get out. Forget trying to label them. Just know that it's these abusive patterns that are the danger, not what we call them. You know, getting out there and talking about narcissism is a hot topic now, and it's certainly um, one that needs to be addressed. But it's when we get stuck into the labels that um, we we limit our support because we're not able to see the bigger picture that it's just not good. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I mean, as a clinician, I'm, you know, very attuned to does a person meet these criteria or those criteria. But as a sociologist, I will also say that those criteria are decided upon by a bunch of clinicians who meet at a hotel for several conferences for several years running. And some years they're going to put this uh, behavior under borderline and some years they're going to take this behavior away from borderline and put it under, uh, you know, an attachment disorder. So, or they're going to put it in both places. So it can be, I, it's interesting to me, people find it somewhat comforting because they will say, oh, now I know what it is. So now I know mm -hmm. he has this narcissistic personality disorder, but sometimes that, then they'll say, well, they've got a disorder. There are things that are to be done for a disorder. Can't it just be fixed? Um, unfortunately, with with these cluster B personality disorders, it, it, it's a long road, um, and the person often doesn't want to travel it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that can be kind of a, a, a um, going down a particular rabbit hole when a partner says, "Oh, now I know what they've got." Like I had a a, a person that I interviewed who said they were online 
reading about anger management because they would see that their partner had these like flare ups and these rages and they didn't know what to do about it. And they themselves were like, Oh no, I need, if I could just manage my anger, things would be okay. And I can help them out. And a um, pop-up showed up that said borderline personality disorder. And so they started reading about it. And they're like this fits, this totally fits my partner. And so they called up a therapist and said, Hey, I've got it. I think I know what's going on with her. She's got borderline personality disorder. Bingo. Voila. Now let's fix it. <laughs> and the therapist said, yeah, come in and we need to talk about this. Um, you know, so people can kind of get excited. If there's a name for it, then there's a, something to be done for it. And I, I agree with you that the name is not so much as important as the, as the pattern. Mm -hmm. And is it something, you know, if, we, if we've got some concerns about something and we put it in front of our partner and we try to work it out, and they're not responsive to it, and we keep at it, and we keep seeing the pattern show up, then we have to kind of accept what, what we're seeing and to know that it's not likely to change. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have to think about the consequences of staying in a relationship that's, that's very, very toxic. Yeah. Um, I, will, I will share with you that, and your followers, a year ago, um, a second cousin of mine, um, somebody I had grown up with. I wasn't, I wasn't close to an adulthood. We had drifted apart, but, but somebody I knew as a, a child and adolescent, I was very close to her mother, um, left an abusive boyfriend and uh, was in that process of setting up her new household. They had been together for 10 years or 12 years or 13 years. And apparently the relationship had been very, very difficult all the way along. Um, she was setting up her own household. She went back to the home she had shared with him to collect a few things. And uh, when she was there was brutally attacked by him and ultimately uh, died as a result of this this horrible attack and i will i will spare your listeners the the details but i will say that they were shocking and macabre and uh, horrifying and so every every summer now so that last summer that prompted me to do a massive giveaway of my books and i will do that in july so if you come to i'll do this in july it's happened in july so if people sign up for my website they'll get an email saying all of my books are free for a month because what I want people to do is take the book and put it in the free little libraries mm -hmm. and let people find it. Right. But my point is that we often underestimate how serious these situations are, mm -hmm. that they do sometimes end in death, that they do sometimes end in somebody, you know, thinking, okay, you know, next year I'll leave in three years, I'll leave. And then they get an illness and, and they can't leave. So it's really important. I mean, I think, you know, if you've been in a toxic relationship and you start a new relationship and you've got a little, you know, something comes up, we can be hair trigger, like tender about things and prone to jump out quickly. So it's important to know the difference between something that's like, this is a yellow light mm -hmm. versus this is a screeching red light. You have to put on the brakes and get out right now. But when we, it doesn't matter whether this is more narcissistic or more antisocial or more borderline, if it's a thing that's scary to you and not workable for you and the person isn't responsive to your concerns about it, um, because these relationships can end in, in death and it's, important to to recognize whether you're just being worn down over the long haul and not able to function in your life or whether your life is at risk um these are uh, relationships that we we just have to take those dynamics very very seriously yeah yeah we really do um working with the domestic violence coalition i have had the um the, the, the amazing gift of working with people that have been changing laws um, to support victims. Um, and I've heard the cases and I've seen and I've met people and my friend circle is now including all of these wonderful advocates and um, the stories that we hear are heartbreaking. And it 
just takes a snap before it goes to the other side of ugly. Um, you know, we, we just think, oh, it's just emotional. Oh, he's just doing this or, you know, whatever. Y you don't realize how often someone gets physically abused until they're dead. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. the statistics are like, I think every hour or every minute someone is being, um, you know, beaten and, and that's where most homicides are in the United States is a domestic violence situation. So, mm -hmm. um. Let's get off of that. Let's, that's, that's scary, but let's talk about, I want to talk about children and um, when same sex couples have children together, how challenging it can be if the situation breaks up. Yeah, I, I'm glad you're bringing that up because this is one of those places where in opposite sex relationships, it, it can happen that one parent is related to the children and one isn't. Um, through, you know, remarriage or various other kinds of events that happen. But in same-sex relationships, um, it tends more often to be the case that uh, if a couple has children, the children are biologically related to one parent and not to the other. Or there's a history of single-parent adoption in states where... Um, same-sex couple adoption has not been legal. So there's been a practice of one partner adopting the child and both parents parenting them um, because it wasn't legal for, for there to be uh, uh, dual adoption by, in, by a same-sex couple. So this comes up a lot because when a relationship ends, whether it was toxic or not, when a relationship ends for whatever reason, it can become very toxic <laughs> around the question of parenting. Mm -hmm. So if the non-biological parent or the non-adoptive parent um, has been involved with the child's life and wants to still be involved with the child's life, they often um, have a very rough road to hoe legally if, if their former partner isn't supportive of the idea of them remaining in the child's life because they have essentially all the power to define who has access to the child. So um, those cases also can be very ugly. And if the relationship was toxic, then access to the child can become, um, the child can kind of become a pawn. Um, the, uh, the victimized uh, surviving spouse um, can often be manipulated into some, some really uh, painful situations like um, the, the, the biological parent uh, moving on, dating somebody else, and asking the non-biological parent to be the child care provider uh, so that they can be with their, their new love interest. And this being the only access the uh, non-biological parent has. And so they really don't necessarily want to be used in this way, but they also don't want to be cut off from from their child so some states have um a little bit of protection wisconsin where i live is one of those there's something called the holtzman statute it was a case brought by a non-biological parent um after the dissolution of a relationship where there was a child involved um holtzman was an attorney uh, she was actually a law student when this started and so brought this case um, and ultimately prevailed. And so in the state of Wisconsin, if you've provided a certain amount of um, residential care, uh, financial support, um, personal supervision to a minor child who isn't your biological offspring, um, you have some possibility of going to court and making the case that, hey, I, you know, I, I, should have as, I should have some kind of um, visitation or time spent with this child. Uh, but uh, this, this is, even though we have same-sex marriage now in the United States, this uh, adoption law, um, uh, uh, parental you know, guardianship of children that you've raised, if you don't have a legal right in them, um, is very patchwork, state by state. And it's extremely painful. So if people are in a same-sex relationship and there are children involved, it's really important for both parents to have legal protections. Um, and if you're with somebody who isn't open to doing that, then it's really important to think about um, 
you know, whether that's a good situation for you, because um, it can be heartbreaking, not just for yourself, but also for the child. And so if we want to be responsible parents, these are things to think of um, up front as much as possible, um, because civil agreements can be, can be arranged, things can, put in, can be put into writing in a proactive way um, to at least give you some kind of record of here's, here's the history of the agreements that we've had, um, which might give you some legal standing. So it's important for, I think sometimes we go, uh, you know, we go into relationships with the best of intentions and assuming the best of intentions on the other person's part. But in the early years, we're still getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the child gets put into a position um, where the, uh, the, the one that's got them is alienating the one that doesn't have them. So now the child is almost like a flying monkey going, I don't want to be with them because this one told me all these bad things. And so it, it, it's the same in same sex as in heterosexual couples. But I think the stigma and the fact that there's no legal repercussions. Can they like work out an arrangement legally before, um, you know, when, when you decide to have a child together, I mean, should same sex couples be getting some kind of legal protection for that child and their relationship with them? Yeah, absolutely. This is what I'm saying is that if you're at the start of the relationship or you're starting to think about getting in more deeply involved with somebody who has children, or you are going to have a child and you're bringing somebody into your life. These are understandings and conversations to have really, really early on so that the child is protected. And I think um, there are lots of parents who do this, lots of same sex parents who do this. They do a great job of it. They think proactively about this. Hey, we intend to stay together. We will do everything we can to stay together. This is, you know, our, our, our commitment. And we recognize that occasionally things don't go well and kids get caught up in this. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. If we have children, how are we going to set it up? So both parents are protected and how are we going to set up? So the child is protected. So having those conversations up front um, is, is really the best thing to do involving local wherever you are um, in this country or in other countries, I know you've probably got people who watch and listen who are in other countries, knowing what the laws are and going to an attorney in your location and talking to them about what the situation is, is, is really beneficial. I have known same-sex couples who've moved from one state to another um, because they wanted to be in a state where there was second, it's called second parent adoption. Um, so that both parents are the legal, both, members of the couple are the uh, uh, legal parents of the children who are adopted. So sometimes couples adopt that strategy because they're, they're very committed to making sure that everybody is protected. So, uh, you know, know, know who you are, know who your partner is and understand what the, what the law is um, so that there's not this horrible mismatch mismatch down the road uh, when we've just we've had an assumption that all will be well and come to discover that that's actually not that's not the case and, and one party has far more legal protections than the others if you're getting involved with if you are the biological parent you're getting involved with somebody and you think I don't know that I would want them to raise my child if something happened to me then it's important for you to rethink whether that would be the person you want to be involved with. If you see red flags out of them about parenting and you're a parent, then it's, then it's important to kind of probably draw the line earlier rather than later. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So and, I appreciate and, the, and when they're starting, it's hard to, to conceive of that at the very beginning of a relationship. It's hard to forecast or even think that because you want it to work. But if we are smarter in knowing, especially in, in a same-sex relationship, that their rights are not equal and that they have to sort of take protection on themselves and on the children right from the get-go. Yeah, and I think this is a thing that sometimes um, the, the broader population in our country doesn't quite understand yet. It's even though they're a same-sex marriage, there is not full equality under the law for people in same-sex relationships. And this um, parenting and adoption is one of those places where it's, where it's really, really apparent. So we still have a ways to go before the other 
places that the law affects us are um, equitable and are, are changed in a direction that 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 is that is equitable. The the thing I would also say, though, Tracy, is that folks who are likely listening to your podcast and watching your YouTube channel have been through these challenging relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of a new relationship, you can recycle all of the challenging parts of a toxic relationship as you, as you start to move forward into creating a life that you really that you're happy about, that you want, having relationships that you enjoy and that you're excited about. We, we can take all that kind of toxic stuff and recycle it and use it as good fertilizer for the next relationship so that you can say, okay, I, you know, I, I learned a lot there because the, often the gift of these relationships is the opportunity to see what we really do want, how strong we are, and places where we have a little bit of a growth edge. So going into the next relationship, we'll say, okay, I, you know, I need at the beginning to be clearer about what I'm, what I'm, what I want, what I stand for. And so we can, the, the gift of these relationships is that when you move forward and you're in a great relationship, you can be like very, very grateful for that and very appreciative of that. You don't take that for granted. And so, um, people do recover, and I just want to, um, you know, perhaps end on that note that that you and I both see that people can go uh, from these horrible, scary places into much more solid, happier, lighter situations. And um, by by helping each other out, and by finding a good team, and leaning onto all kinds of resources, um, life can get better. And it's important to recognize that's the truth. You can feel very stuck, but the, the reality of feeling stuck and being completely stuck, there, there's a gap there. And so if you're watching this, you're listening to this, and you want a way forward, really encourage you to uh, reach out to somebody in your vicinity or to lean into these online resources or to find a coach or therapist or a group like Tracy's Meetups and um, help yourself start to untangle things. Yeah. Life can get better. And it will, you know, there's, I, I talked to the group last night and, and said to, to think of the silver lining and, and right now, depending on where they are in the, in the, the recovery process, the silver lining might be that you get the chance to start again and be free from the abuse and never let it happen again. If that's the only silver lining, um, that's a win. You know, we're, we're not stuck. Our lives aren't over after abuse. They've really just begun. And if we do the work on ourselves, we will empower ourselves to be in healthier relationships going forward. So I want to thank you so much for joining me. This has been wonderful. I love talking to you and I can't wait to get this out. Um, and I want everybody to follow you because I'm going to put your name at the bottom there and they can get on your mailing list and, um, you know, find out about those books that you're going to offer in July. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm, ex thank you for doing that. I'm excited about this giveaway because, um, last year people, uh, got these books at either free or very low cost, um, and then started putting them in free little libraries. I don't know if you have those mm -hmm. where you are, but they're just these great little community resources. You drop off a book and somebody takes it. And so people have put them in their community libraries. They put them in the free little libraries. And what we know is then people like take the book, give it a read, um, and get, get some, I hope, some, uh, support and skills and inspiration for moving moving forward so i'm excited about doing that and it feels like the appropriate thing for me to do as a memorial to my cousin um and uh so i appreciate everybody helping me with it um because working together we can we can help each other out so tracy thank you so much really really great to talk with you and uh to connect with the folks who follow you online thank you so much Thank you so much for joining me. And if you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe. I love that you are here and I welcome bringing any kind of healing to you. Um, I have a website, 
and I have a podcast. So if you are listening to the podcast, you know about me, but if you are listening on YouTube, you might be learning that I have a podcast out there and you can find it under my name, Tracy A. Malone. And I'm all over the place from iTunes to Stitcher to iHeartRadio. So you can find me wherever you listen to your information, whether you're in the car, waiting for your kids to come out of soccer games. Podcasts are great for that. They just feed you information in that boring time while you're driving to work. So um, follow me there and I welcome all of your input and feedback. If you are in a relationship and you're totally stuck and you're, you're wanting to move forward, but you can't get the obsessive thoughts of this person out of your head, you, you are unable to like break that tie and, and the pain and the hurt is so bad that you just don't know where to turn. On my website, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com, I've got some amazing tools and I have two courses that I know will help you. This is the time for you to invest in yourself, in your time, your money, and get yourself the help that you need. Doing the work means learning about yourself. If you've got PTSD symptoms, your doctor might not even like diagnose you. They just probably give you antidepressants, sleep pills, and anxiety pills and said, have a nice day. You've been through trauma and you need to work this out. So my course on my website is something that you do in your own home and it is going to free you from those obsessive thoughts, the fear and the resentment that is going through your head right now. So visit NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Uh, I also have a Facebook group if you are looking for some additional support. So um, the links are all on my website to all of the social channels that we use to help bring you the information that you need to heal. That's all I got.